God, Lord, to be the people that you've called us to be. Lord, we pray that you would feed us, Lord, with living bread tonight. Lord, there was a little boy in those Gospels who only had a few fish and a couple of loaves of bread. And in his hands, it was dead. It was stagnant. It was very limited, Lord. But he put it in your hands. And you took that bread and you blessed it and you broke it, Lord. And it was enough for everybody. God, we all have a need from you tonight. Lord, we put this night in your hands. We put this word into your hands. Lord, we're asking You to bless it, break it, and multiply it, Lord, so that there's something for everybody, a word for everybody. Lord, we bless You tonight, and we thank You for each person that's here. Lord, speak to us by Your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. 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 If you you can be seated, if you have your Bibles tonight, will you turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Uh, We're not live streaming on Facebook tonight because I left my iPad at home. So I'm getting real good at that, leaving things at home, leaving things behind. But uh, we've got got enough to have service tonight anyway. So uh, we're going to try to, uh, I'm going to do my best to put both uh, services today. I'll upload them. I'm going to put them on an app called Spreaker. And uh, if you if you have a you can get a Spreaker account. It's easy to get, easy to find. You can see it on my Facebook page, and you can listen to the messages there. I have a lots of messages uh, that we put on uh, we put there. Uh, I, I pick and choose the ones I don't like the way they go. I don't put them on there. But uh, Amen. But uh, we're going to try to put them on there, and and uh, hopefully they'll be a blessing to somebody. You can listen to them later. Or you can share them with your friends, your neighbors, or your family. But. Uh, over the last couple weeks, we've been going through Romans chapter 5, and I believe the Lord has uh, instructed me and led me to go through Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and in chapter 8. Romans chapter 5, really, we catch Paul at the tail end of a discourse on justification by faith. And to be justified means to be declared innocent in the eyes of God. That the moment God sees that you've believed, you've embraced, you've accepted Jesus Christ, the blood that He shed for you on the cross, then God declares a verdict over your life as not guilty, innocent, free of all charges. And that wasn't because you you changed and you were good or because you did anything right. You simply believed. You agreed with God. Repentance means to come into agreement with God. It means I agree with God about what He says about my sin, that it's evil, it's wicked, and it deserves eternity in a lake of fire. But I also agree with God with what He did about my sin, right? That He didn't send hoops and religious gimmicks that I could run through and laws that I could keep, but He he gave me faith to believe in His Son and what His Son did for me at Calvary. And God puts an offer on the table that I don't care who you are or what you've done, if you'll turn from your sin and embrace my son, I will pronounce you to be innocent, to be legally forgiven of all charges. And at that moment, we're brought in to the family of God. And so we're learning about justification. Chapter 6 really deals with sanctification, that after we're justified, there's still some things in our life that aren't what they should be. There's things in our life that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't bring forth a test testimony of the glory and the praise and the worth of Jesus Christ and knew one thing about people that are born again is that they have a desire that wants to please God. A lost man out there in that world, he don't care. He may care about what people thinks about him, but he's not worried about what God thinks about him other than he probably don't want to go to hell when he dies. But the new creature, this nature and this desire inside of him, it's different. It's not just that I don't want to go to hell when I die, but I don't want to bring shame upon the name of Jesus Christ. And I want my life to please him. I want my life to be different from other people, not just so people can think that I'm something great, but so people can see I want what he has. I want what she has in their life because people are looking. People are desperate for some kind of peace. And, you know, we see right here in our community just over the last month, there's been at least two or three suicides. That, that, that's a horrible uh, indictment upon the church of Jesus Christ that I looked for an answer, but I couldn't find none. And when I thought there's no other hope for me in my life, then I'm willing to take my own life. That's, that's what that means. So the, the new creature in Christ, I want to live a life that glorifies God, not just when people are 
are watching me and noticing me, but God's always looking at me, right? I can't deceive Him. I can't pull anything over Him. He knows the steps that I take and the desires and the thoughts of my heart. So it's important for us to learn how to live for God. There's a way to live for God. There's many ways that seem right, but the end of them ways lead in death. But God has a way. And Jesus said, I am that way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody's going to the Father that doesn't come through Him. Romans chapter 7 really deals with the believer's relationship with the law. That if you think that the things that you do apart from Christ are going to earn you anything from God as it pertains to salvation and victory, what it's going to do is have a different effect on your life and things will end up worse than they ever started. So we're, going to, we're, going, we're headed towards dealing with that. Romans chapter 8, that's the place that we're trying to get. The place of no condemnation in a life that's governed by the Spirit of God. That's where we want to be. That's where we're headed towards. So I encourage you to be here on Sunday night as we learn this and pray for these teaching. If you have a friend somewhere that's struggling, needs help, bring them with you. Don't have to be a member of this church. We don't even have a membership role. Just come, bring them with you. We'd love to have them. You can share these teachings as we put them out on Facebook. If you've missed any, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Not because I was the one who preached it, but because I truly believe that this will make the difference in your life. I know it made a great difference in my life, but tonight... Uh, we've been through, we've been all the way through uh, verse 11. In the first few verses, we dealt with justification by faith. The next verses, we dealt with how trials and tribulations, they work something in our life. God, God allows pressure to come into our life so we'll, we'll be shaped and we'll be formed into the image of Christ. And then in the, in the following verses, we, verses 6 through uh, on, we read about how God's love was towards us even when we were His enemies. And God proved His love not by just telling us that He loved us, but by sending His Son to die for us. And as we said this morning, there should never ever be a doubt or a question in my life does God love me? Because when, he, when I was His enemy, He sent His Son to die for me. I, I heard a preacher share an analogy like this. There, you remember just a couple of years ago overseas, there were those uh, Islamists dressed in all black with those masks over their heads, and there were those Christian refugees in orange, and they're on their knees on the bank of that ocean. And those Islamists uh, are standing there, those Muslims standing there with swords in their hand, and on a live video, they chop the heads off of those men. That, that's the enemies of Christianity. It's the enemies of God. But it was, and boy, this anger rises up within us. Most of us would say, you know, I'd have liked to have been there with a, an AK-47 or something like that. But God is so different than the ways of man. It would be like a, a man saying, a man seeing that and knowing that, but then saying to his son, son, I love those guys in black holding those swords so much that I want you to go and suffer and die at their hands so that I can save them. That's hard to fathom. That's hard to understand. But the Bible says that when we were the enemies of God, He sent His Son not to die for good people, not to die for godly people, but to die for His enemies because God wanted to reconcile with us. But tonight we come, we're going to begin reading in verse 12 and read through verse 19. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so sin passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift." For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it is by one, the one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one into condemnation, 
But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men unto condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Listen to verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The title of this message uh, tonight is going to be Two Men or the Two Adams. And as you probably picked up in, in this teaching, Paul is dealing with the contrast of two men. The one, the one man is Adam, the first Adam, and the second man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the subject is because of the sin of one man, because of the sin of that first man, death, sin was passed unto all men. And because sin was passed, death reigned from one. Sin and death reigns. We receive sin and death from Adam, but we have the opportunity to receive righteousness and life by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole world exists tonight in one of these two men. The whole world exists either in Adam or in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the Apostle Paul's doctrine, we should, you should, I should, we should all pay very close attention to the teachings, the doctrines, and the writings of the Apostle Paul. Those first 12 disciples, they were sent primarily to the nation of Israel. They were sent to the Jews. There was like 10 or 15 years passed after the death of Jesus Christ before Peter and the other apostles even realized that Gentiles could be saved. Imagine how many people died that could have been saved, but the revelation hadn't come to those disciples that those Gentiles could be saved. They, they didn't realize that God had removed the petition that separated a Jew from a Gentile and had made one man in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, every it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you're in Adam and you die, you die in your sins and you die and go to hell. But likewise, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've been justified. You've been declared legally innocent from your sins. And when you die... God has nothing to judge you by. God has nothing to hold against you because you've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. But God raised up Paul. Jesus Christ was the one apostle that Christ ordained from heaven and sent him specifically to the Gentiles, people like you and I. And it was unto Paul that was given the revelation of the new covenant. Paul said, the revelation that I got, I didn't get it by man, neither did I learn it, but it came by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught him the meaning of the new covenant by reading the old covenant. Everything that Paul read, he didn't have these letters or these epistles or these gospels, but God began to unveil to him the new covenant as he would read and study the Old Testament, the, the old covenant. But over and over in the Apostle Paul's writings, we find the phrase in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, that's where we are tonight. We're either in Adam or we're in Christ. And as we're born as children, Oh, it's a good thing. I've done it three times. Be in that hospital room with my wife and they pull that baby out of, out of her and kicking and screaming and be the first one standing there to hold that baby. And it, that's a good thing, man. That, that's, that's a joyful thing to be standing there holding that baby. But the truth is about that baby, as beautiful as they are and as much as we love them, that baby, like all babies, is born in sin. David said in Psalms 51, he said, in sin, he said, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't mean that his, his mother was an adulterer or a fornicator or anything like that, but it means that from birth, that's what we are. We are born sinners separated from God because the first 
first man, our father Adam, he is the fountainhead of the entire human race. All of us come from him. There's people that skin is different color than ours and they talk different than we do and they're born in different parts of the world. But there's no question about where did we come from. We all come from that first man that God created. His name was Adam. And we were all in Adam the day that Adam took of that fruit. He ate from that wrong tree and Adam sinned. Adam fell out with God and judgment was pronounced upon that man and that woman and everyone that come from them, they're born in that place, born in sin, born in Adam, born as that old creation. Adam fell from a place of total God conscience his whole life. Evolved around God. God comes down in that garden in the cool of the day. If you're hungry, you pull whatever it is off the fruit of that vine. He's got, I imagine him walking around by tigers and lions and bears. They wouldn't bite him. He'd walk up there and rub him on the head and go on. He has complete dominion. He's placed into a perfect world. And he's been made the ruler over it all. And God delights in this man. God likes this man. He enjoys having fellowship with this man. And he's clothed in the likeness and in the image of God. But sin entered into his life. And that that image was destroyed. And he was pushed out of the presence of God. And, and, And that image became corrupted. His nature became corrupted. He's no longer God conscious but he's self-conscious. He realizes he's naked. He's trying to cover that up all of his life. And he became a self-serving people. And that's what we are at our core. We're self-serving at our core. Every one of us, it's about me, myself, and I. And even apart from Christ, the good that people do is just to be noticed, just to be recognized, all of that. And it's only in Christ Jesus that our behavior can be made right. So what God's trying to do, God's attempt in the world is to remove us from that place of being in Adam and place us into the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the two men. It's in, 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 these are the two men. This is what Paul meant by being in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes we hear people say, well, that's just the way I am. Well, the way that we are, we have the opportunity to be changed. And we could all say that. That's just the way that I am. Because we're all born. But if we stay just the way that we are, we're in trouble with God. Because we're without excuse. Because we've been given the opportunity to be changed by the grace of God. And it's impossible for us to be in Christ and to remain the same. And within Adam and within Christ, there's a nature When Adam sinned, Adam's nature changed. Your nature is who you are on the inside, the way you are on the inside. Not only why you, not only what you do, but why you do the things that you do. And we find that there's a nature that goes along with being in Adam. We we find outside of that garden, Adam has two sons in the beginning, Cain and Abel. And and man had failed from that place of being wrapped in the, the glory and the image of God until he's at that place where Adam uh, Cain is angry with his brother. So he slew his brother. He killed his brother as they talked in the field. That was not the creation that God made. That wasn't in that man's heart in the beginning. But with sin, there comes a nature. There comes a sin nature that says, I'm about me, myself, and I. And as long as you're helping me and doing what I want you to do, then I have love for you. I have acceptance for you. But the moment you resist me, I'll destroy you. I will run over you. I will crush you. That's the nature of sin, and sadly, that is the nature of man. So in these verses, we have a great contrast between Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Adam's disobedience, it brought certain death upon all mankind. But the other man's obedience, it made eternal life possible and available for all. And in Paul's dealing in verse 12 He says, by one man sin entered into the world and death came by sin so that death passed upon all men. This means a sentence of death passed upon all men because all men have sinned. Adam was the first of God's highest creation. 
And he was the fountainhead or the source, the father of all humanity. And Satan, he, really sin originated in Satan when Satan decided that he's going to rebel against God and it entered into his heart and he says, I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to be like God. And Satan attempts to exalt himself to the place of God in heaven. And a third of the angels in heaven, this should be a, a warning to us about how, how easily it could be deceived. These angels are in heaven. They see God. They see the throne. They see the whole thing. But here comes this warning a created being named Lucifer and he says I'm not satisfied with the place that God has given me I want to exalt myself to be like God and by doing so he deceived a third of all the angels in heaven and they were cast out of heaven and they they were cast down into the earth well Satan's watching he's angered and he's full of vengeance I want to get back at God but he can't fight God he'd be destroyed he'd be crushed he can't get to God so in order order to get at God, he attacks God's creation. He attacks that man. He sees from a distance that God is pleased with Adam. He, I like to go down there and meet with Adam in the cool of the day. And the Bible says two men can't walk together unless they're agreed. Two can't walk together unless they be agreed. And God and Adam would walk together. Adam is in complete and total Agreement with God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 21, God says, Let us make man in our image after, li- after our likeness. So God goes down and creates that man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. And they have communion, they, they have fellowship one with another. Well, him being the, the source of all humanity. If that source becomes polluted, then everything that comes after him, it becomes polluted too. When the Mississippi River, there's places that you go to and it's a mile or more across it. A great big gushing river, but it starts out as a little old, it starts out in a lake up in Minnesota. The river's, I think, like 5,000 plus miles long. It's a long river, but it starts as a little creek coming out of that that lake in Minnesota. And if you went to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and you poisoned the Mississippi River, well, it all wouldn't be poison. It, it would flush out, and that which is up above it would be all right. But if, if you go to the source, if you went to that lake and you poison that lake, eventually that's going to run into the whole thing so that that whole river is polluted. It's all poison. Adam is the, the first, the, the source. He's, he's where that all this stuff flows out of. And that source became corrupted and it flowed down. It flowed into all men. The Bible says that Adam was created after God's likeness at his image. But that image became destroyed when sin entered into his life. And then Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3 The Bible says that Adam and his wife, they brought forth sons and daughters after their image, after their likeness. Everything produces after its own kind. And the children that he brought forth, they were children of sin. They were children of bondage. They grow up outside of God's presence. They don't know God. They don't know God's way. And this passes on. Cain kills his brother and he moves into a city called Nod. And they build a civil... civil, uh, they, they build a, a civilization. They learn to live. And one preacher, he, he said to me, he says, this is where the greatest sin of all was committed because it was there that man learned to live a life apart from God. Right? I don't need God. I get my food. I get what I need. I get my clothing. I make it. I, I'm all right. And people begin to live life without God. Whereas in that garden, everything was about God. Now we're outside of here, the fallen sons of Adam. We don't need God. We get it on our own. We get it the hard way. But that's just the way that life is. So they say, well, you fast forward a few hundred years, about really about 1,600 years, and you get to uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, I'll just read this to you. You you could write this verse down if you're taking notes. But in Genesis 6 and verse 5, it says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, listen, was only evil continually. That's what sin, it started out, I, I ate the wrong fruit from the wrong tree, but now man doesn't get worse. 
man doesn't get better, man gets worse. And it gets to the place right before Noah's flood where they say, God says, every thought of a man's heart is only evil continually. They never think about anything good. Every thought they have is bad. And in Genesis five, Genesis 6 and verse 6, it says, It repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. Creation became perverted. It became changed. This man that God created to bear His image, bear His likeness, and to be His friend, to have fellowship with, now all of this has been twisted. It's been manipulated. It's been destroyed by sin so that now he don't seek after God. He don't call on God. He doesn't repent of anything. As a matter of fact, every thought he has is only evil continually and then God started over in a sense with Adam or uh, with Noah a righteous man but man failed and man's been fallen ever since if you look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 it says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Holding the truth in unrighteousness means I know what I should be doing. I do know what's right. Most Americans, wherever they are, are holding the truth in unrighteousness because it's hard to be an American and not at least know something about Jesus, right? You go into a gas station and there's a King James Bible sitting on the shelf of a gas station. There's churches on every corner. If you want to know the gospel, on the radio, it's on the television. If you want to know, you can know. But sadly, that darkened heart of man says, I like my life the way it is. I don't really want to go to hell when I die, but I'm not giving up this life. And they trade eternal life for a few years of, of things that make them feel good. And the Bible says God's wrath is revealed against that. This is the, the, the word for wrath here. It's not the picture of God throwing fire down from heaven, but it means God is resisting them. God's holding them back and nothing that they do will ever prosper. Even if they become rich and wealthy and famous, it's still they're not making any advance, any headway as it pertains to drawing near to the Lord. Verse 19, Romans 1.19, it says, "...because that which, way be, that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God showed it to them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His external power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God." Neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is all talking about the downward spiral of man. That it, It's not doing this and going up, but it's getting worse and worse. People have had an opportunity. Look at the, look at the opportunity America has had. Look at the preachers. Look at the men of God that God has raised up in this nation that, oh, just powerful, mighty men of God. God has sent revival after revival after revival. There's never been a foreign invasion on this soil. God has protected us. God has blessed us to, to where... But all the Bible says that the goodness of God is to lead us to repentance. That when you, in an honest heart, if you would think about how good God has been to you, it will just make you bow your head. You ought to do it sometime. Get off by yourself and just think about how good God has been to you and how unfaithful you have been to Him. And it will make you just put your head in your hands and weep and say, thank you Jesus for who you are, for everything thing I'm not you are Lord and you've been so good to me but the Bible says that when they knew God they didn't glorify him as God neither were they thankful and because of this their mind has been darkened and in verse 23 it says they changed the, the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things and God gave them up to uncleanness and through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies 
between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We see this all the time in, in America where people love animals more than they love human life. Right? It's, it's to the point where I just saw this thing the other day where it's a, it's a federal offense big time if you, if you harm an eagle's nest. But in New York City, it's legal. You can murder your own baby up until the day before, up, right up until that baby is born. How backward is that? And people worship animals. They don't worship God. They worship creation, but they don't worship the Creator. In verse 26, it says, For this cause God gave them up. When it says God gave them up, it means He put them into another, another set of hands. He gave them up to their vile affections. For even the women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men left the natural use of a woman and burned in lust towards one another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of the error that was meet. For, when, for even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And that's a, that's that downward spiral. It'll make you cry. This man started out with God in paradise. And now it's gotten to the place where men burn in lust for other men. men. Women burn in lust for other women. They worship animals. All this type of a stuff. I tell you all this to show you that's where man's fallen to. And things aren't getting better. That's what man is apart from God. And it doesn't, it doesn't, what it is, is it entered in by this one man, by one man, Adam, all fell into sin. That's where it come from. And with that sin, there comes a nature that it starts out most of the time even in little children. Nobody holds a gun to your head to make you do bad things, but there's just this craving, there's this desire in that human heart to go the wrong way. And before we know it, we're in over our heads, we're in bondage, and we end up doing things that we thought we'd never do, going places we thought we would never go. Innocence is lost in our heart. It's hardened by sin. And so it was against that sin that God's judgment fell. But after that horrible, out of that horrible situation came an opportunity for God to display His love and His kindness and His grace to the world. And that's in the free gift of salvation. Because those who cannot help themselves, the people that we just read about cannot change themselves. And that isn't somebody off over yonder. It's us, me and you tonight. Without God, we're all capable of all of those things. So the people that cannot help themselves must be helped by somebody else in order for there to be hope. So this one Adam, he failed. He blew it. And everybody fell with him. He drug everybody down with him. So God has another Adam. Jesus Christ comes on the scene. The Bible says that the first Adam is of the earth earthy, but the second Adam is the Lord from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And like Adam, Jesus is a representative of a new human race. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15.22 that as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. All have the opportunity to be made alive. We died in Adam. And the place, and it doesn't, now I can't just say that, well, I come from sinners, so I'm a sinner. Even though that is true, that, that's not an excuse for me to stay like I am. God reached into this world with another Adam. Just like this first Adam, He's created perfect. He has no sin nature. But because He chose to rebel against God, the whole human race fell out with Him. He was the representative of us all. And when God sees us, when we're not saved and we're apart from Christ, that same judgment that came against Adam 
That's the way God sees us. Unclean, no good, unfit for the kingdom of God. That kind. Adam ain't going to heaven. I don't know if Adam was saved or not. I don't know if he made things right with God or not. I really don't think he did. Going the way that his family went, I really, I really don't think he did. God made a way for them to at least have some a relationship with Him because Cain and Abel knew to come to that altar and bring God an offering. And Abel knew, God don't want the fruits of a field. God doesn't want my good works. God wants this lamb to be slain. God must have told them that. God must have preached some gospel to them to give an opportunity to where relationship with God could at least be partially restored unto the day of Jesus Christ. But you don't find Adam at that altar. And in every place where Adam's mentioned in this Bible, it always represents sin it also it always represents death and he's on one side and Jesus Christ is on the other and God says all those that are in Adam are unfit for my presence they can't come in anymore so God reaches with another Adam Jesus Christ come in John chapter 3 and verse 3 he told Nicodemus he says Nicodemus unless a man is born again he cannot see the kingdom of heaven Nicodemus is a good man he's a religious teacher of that day. He probably doesn't do the sins that we read about. He's trying to be a good man. And he comes to Jesus by night because I'm curious about you. I I realize you got something that the rest don't. And I want to know. I want to know who you are and where'd you come. And Nicodemus says, Lord, you, uh, Master, I know you're a teacher that's come from God. And Jesus just looks at him and says, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot even see. Unless you're born again, unless that old man dies, that person that you are in Adam, unless he dies and a new man is raised up, you're never going to understand the things of the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked him, well, how can I, can I enter in back into my mother's womb? Jesus said in John 3 and verse 14, he said, just like that Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. And in Numbers, I believe it's Numbers chapter 23, the people begin to murmur against God and God sent fiery serpents that begin to bite the people of Israel and a plague's going out, people are dying, all kind of chaos is breaking loose. Moses begins to pray for God to God. And God tells Moses to take a, a, a piece of brass and, and forge out a, a serpent. Brass represents judgment. The serpent, it represents sin. The those snakes are biting these people and it represents the, the, the bite and the pain of sin. There's poison within those snakes. There's poison that's within sin that you don't go out and just do something wrong, sin against God without it attaching to you, without it, it affecting you, that it's not just a topical thing, but it gets deep down and it, preserve, it perverts your soul. It perverts your heart and, and no, no little light thing is going to take it away. So God says, Moses, Moses, you take that serpent of brass and you lift it up on a pole. And anybody in this camp that will look to that brazen serpent, the sting of that pain will be gone. Look to that pole and you will live. Well, Jesus says in the same way, just like that serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, I'm going to be lifted up. And the pain of sin, the sting of sin, the perversion, the pollution of sin... I'm going to take that upon myself. And if you'll look to the cross, if you'll look to what I'm going to do at Calvary, then life will be put in you. This is what it takes. This is what makes a man to be born again. We don't believe in evolution. Like that man come drastically changed through millions of years from monkeys and became what he is today. And neither do we believe in Christian evolution where you just start coming to church and singing better songs and reading better books and saying nicer things and eventually you just work yourself up to this level of being a a child of God. No, it's it's just like that baby is born out of his mother's womb. You and I must be born by the Spirit of the living God.
God that in an instant it happens. Jesus said it's just like the wind comes and blows. You don't know it. You can't see it. You don't know where it comes from. But you can feel that wind when it blows. And you can feel when you've been made a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't get a letter from heaven that says, congratulations, you're now a child of God. But I do know there was a time when I was headed for hell. My nature was bad. My thoughts were bad. My mind and my heart was corrupted. But I cried out to this Jesus and He made me new. And I may not can explain all about it, but I can feel that it happened. The Bible says that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And I know that I know that I know that somewhere up in glory is a book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you look through them pages, my name is written in His book. A new name's been written in that book in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's when that old man dies and a new man is created. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's really talking about the resurrection. But in verse 49, it's, it, it says there that we've, we've bared the image of the earthly, but we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. What it's talking about is that this flesh and blood is not going to heaven, but this we're going to put off uh, corruption and put on incorruption. We're going to take off mortality and put on immortality. And we'll be changed, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye. John wrote that when we see Him, we shall be as Him. That I'm not taking this old body to heaven, but I'm getting a new body. A body like His. A, a, a perfect body. A, a, a heavenly body. But he says, just like we bore the image of the earthly... There's not anybody in here that hadn't felt the effect of what Adam did in your life. We grew up and maybe you saw it in your parents or in your grandparents or you saw it in, in other people. We've all known people who were good people. right? I can remember growing up spending time with uh, my, like my uncles and stuff, and I, I knew they they were. I liked being around them, but some of the things that they did, I I couldn't understand why. I didn't know why they did the things that they did. Well, it's because of this this effect of sin. We all have our own things. I don't know why I do the things that I do. That's because of that nature and bearing the image of Adam. But the Bible says we bore His image. Now we're going to bear the image of the heavenly and that is that new nature just like we received a nature from adam that bends us in the wrong way when we're born again we receive a new nature the nature of the lord jesus christ that in an instant this is how you know if you're born again this is how you know if somebody else is born again as best you can tell do you want to please god do you want to live for god do you want it your life to, or do you just shrug your sins off and this, it don't matter? I, not, well, if that's the case, then you're, you're probably not going to heaven. But if sin bothers you, and it doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it does mean that I, I want to be changed and I want to be made like Him. In, a, in Ephesians chapter 4, that, that's the effects of that new nature coming inside of you. Because when you're out in that world lost and living for yourself, that's all you care about. But when this new man comes alive, now here there's a part of me, an overwhelming desire of my life that I want to live for Jesus. Now I want to bring in glory. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Paul said, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that from now on you should walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, they've been callous. Sin makes you callous. Just like... When you're a child, your hands are real nice and soft, but you grow up and you do. I remember one day I was at the sink with one of my uncles and he said, when your hands get old and gritty like, tough and gritty like mine, you can use this steel wool. And he just took that steel wool just, and I tried it, man, it cut me all to pieces, right? But those hands are past feeling. Well, that heart, the longer that we remain in sin, or the longer that we re remain not listening to the voice of the Lord, our heart gets like that. 
And it doesn't mean God stops talking. It doesn't mean God stops dealing with us. But it means that we fail to hear what God is saying. Things no longer bother us. But the Bible says they've been past feeling. And have given themselves unto lasciviousness to work uncleanness and greediness. But listen in verse, that, that's that old way, right? That's that old way of Adam. That's that old life. But in verse 20, he says, but you've not so learned Christ. He says, Jesus is not that way. He says, if so be that you have heard him and you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. When we get in Jesus, lights start going on, right? And you don't need a preacher. I don't want to, I don't really do that. And I don't want to do that. Just stand up here and scream at people, name every kind of sin that I can think of. If you're a child of God, you ought to know what's right. You ought to know what's wrong. The Bible says the truth is in Jesus. I know I didn't need somebody to just put their finger in my face and tell me everything that was wrong. Sometimes that may be necessary, but we have a different life that laws, not those laws written on stone commandments, but we have the law of God written in our hearts. And you know when you say things you shouldn't say. You know when you go somewhere you shouldn't go. You know when you look at something you shouldn't look at. You know when you take something that isn't yours. There's a conviction that comes into your heart to put that back, make that right. Lord, forgive me for saying that. I don't want to talk like that. I don't want to treat people like that. Any of that. We're growing because the truth is in Jesus. Lights start coming on. What was acceptable in that old family, it ain't acceptable in this family. I've shared this story with you before. I'll share it with you again. One day, me and my wife went to the mall in Tupelo and all of our kids and when I go shopping, I know what I want. I go in there and get it, and I'm out the door, and I'm, I'm not spending time looking around. Women shop different than men, right? They'll go in there and look all day and won't buy anything. The man go in there, and I get this from my daddy and my granddaddy. I can run through some money. If I like it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it, right? Well, anyway, we'd been in that mall, seemed like all day. And I'm holding them kids, trying to keep them still, and... Uh, well, I, I let my wife shop and get some stuff, you know, because I want her to. Well, we get in there, and I go, we go find her. I done had all I could take of them kids up, cooped up in that mall. Well, she don't have nothing. <laughs> and we done been here all this time. Well, I'm mad. She's mad. Everybody's mad. And we drive all the way home from Tupelo. Nobody says a word. I'm not apologizing. She's wrong. I'm right. I don't care if she's mad. This is just the way it's going to be. I'm going to show her. Well, we get home, and I realize we left the lawnmower out, and uh, it's about to rain, so I go get on that lawnmower, and I'm out there in the shed, and the Spirit of God starts dealing with my heart, and He says, this ain't the way we act in this family, and I begin to cry like a little baby sitting on that lawnmower, and I go up there to that house with my hat in my hand, and I ask my wife to please forgive me for acting like I've acted. And that I was wrong. This is the way this family is. No matter what anybody does to you, the only choice you have is to forgive them. Jesus said that if we're not willing to forgive other people, then He's not going to, our Father is not going to forgive us. We don't have a right to hold a grudge against anybody or have some little petty attitude. And the Lord wants to deal not only with those big, big sins that everybody can see, but even the attitudes in our heart. That it isn't God's nature for us to be arguing and fighting at the house. It isn't God's nature for us to be mean to our children, mean to our Lord. God isn't like that way. The, one man says you can, tell, uh, you can tell if a man's saved or not by the way he treats his dog, right? You don't kick that dog no more if you, if you love God, right? God will deal with you. One man, he got saved. He used to kick that dog and beat that dog all the time. But they said the whole countryside knew when he was saved and the dog knew it too because he didn't kick that old dog anymore. And, amen. That dog was real happy that that man had gotten things right with God. The Bible says that We haven't learned these things from Christ, but we've been taught by Him. We've heard Him. We've been taught by Him because the truth is in Jesus. And He says this, this is the truth that's in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former lifestyle of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. That life that we used to live, you put it off. 
And it doesn't have to be just outright evil things. You, you, there's some things that you, when you think about, well, does the Bible say I shouldn't do this? Well, maybe there ain't a chapter and a verse that says thou shalt not do thus and so. But the Spirit of God deals with your heart and says that it's wrong. I don't want you doing it. I don't want you watching it. I don't want you reading it. I don't want you going. And it may not be the same for everybody. We may have convictions that are different. But there's things that don't fit this new man. There's things that we can't do for the glory of God. There's things that we can't do for the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. There's things that if we do them, what they're going to do is they're going to damage our testimony. And they're going to hurt our witness before this world. Well, the Bible says that we can put that old man off and be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Spending our, our, our lives, however long you were lost, however long you were out in that world, 20, 30, 40 years, that mind gets corrupted. It gets, it gets bad. It gets darkened. But God's work and the Spirit of God is renewing to wash that mind, to cleanse that mind, to replace your thoughts, to replace your desires. The Bible says that we've been given the mind of Christ. You know what the mind of Christ is? I want to do the will of God. I want to be pleasing to the Lord. God's re- we're being renewed in the spirit of our mind. And He says, and that you put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That old man, his, he's corrupt, and every, that man in Adam, corrupt and everything about him. But God says we can put on a new man which after God or after the image of God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So everything Adam lost in that fall, we can gain it back in Jesus Christ. Putting on a new man is not some work to go out and do, but it's an act of faith that that old man died with Christ and the person that I am today is not bound by anything. And I can look at things, sometimes there's a pull to take the tendency, the easiest things we all struggle with, going back to the person that we were before. Because this Christianity, many times, it gets hard and it gets difficult. A lot of times we just say, what's the use? The easiest thing for us to do is go back to the person that we, sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is believe that I am a new person, a new man, a new woman in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we embraced Him, when we received Him, we put on a new man. It's not bound by anything, not in bondage to anything. And I've been created after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. Righteousness and true holiness. It's not a long dress and long hair and no makeup and All of that true holiness starts in the heart. David prayed to the Lord and he said, Lord, you desire holiness in the inward man, in the inward parts. We can look like an angel on the outside and be a devil on the inside. God's true holiness starts on the inside that Jesus got a hold to my heart and he don't let me go. All of this has been redone, recreated. Everything was lost in Adam. And in Him it's separated from God. But God reconciled all things back to Himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through Him, I don't need an excuse to say that's the way I am. But when I see things, when I see still that still the way I am, and I don't like it, I can bring that to the cross and say, Lord, I don't want to be this anymore. And it's the will of God that you be free from that and that everything in your life be brought to submission to the Spirit of God so that He can lead you and guide you. That's what I want to be, Lord, is that new man created in righteousness, true holiness, after the image of God. Amen. Father, thank You tonight for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for Your presence. Lord, we thank You for Your truth. Lord, we thank You. That God, though that first creation, it was messed up and it was polluted. Lord, you have a new creation that you've recreated us in Christ Jesus. Lord, the Bible says in uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 10 that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Lord, that you're you're recreating our lives. You're recreating us, Lord, so that we're created in your image and in your likeness. 
And Lord, the desire of our heart is to be like You, to draw near to You, to bring You glory, to bring You honor, and to bring You praise. Lord, and I pray that this body, Lord, everybody in this room tonight, that that is their desire, that I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a man of God. I want to be a woman of God. Lord, I see what I am apart from You. I'm not going up. I'm going down fast. I'm falling fast. Lord, but I can commit my heart and my life to You. Lord, I believe that what You did for us at Calvary and the giving of Your Son, Lord, is more than enough provision to change who I am, to change what I do, to change my nature, to change my heart, Lord, to change even the desires of this heart, Lord. And God, I pray that we'd be a people being conformed to Your image, Lord, to be like You, Lord, that You would receive the glory and the honor and the praise. And God, I pray that You would put Your hand, Lord, Your safeguard and protecting hand upon each one. Go with them where they go. Lord, put Your hands upon their life and change them. Mold them and shape them this week, Lord, to Your glory, Your image, and Your likeness. God, bring us back here next week, Lord, with a testimony of what Jesus did in our lives. God, we thank You for who You are. We thank You for all You've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.